ngā mahi uh, mahana, ngā, ngā mahi nunui ki a koe mō tō uh, mahi ki au. Um, nō reira uh, ka huri atu uh, ki ngā hongora, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko tainu e te waka, waipā te awa, uh, ngā te mani poto te iwi, uh, ko pirongi e te maunga, uh, ko Ainsley Kripsua, ahau. Uh, um, this is the maunga, or the mountain of, of my tūpuna. Um, Pirongia, it is a place that I feel belonging to. Uh, it represents connection to my large extended whānau, and its lofty imposing figure inspires me to believe that we and I can achieve success. Uh, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, at least one in every six and a half children, children's brains are irreversibly affected by trauma as a result of exposure to family violence. The anatomy and function um, brain changes of a child affected by family violence is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the trajectory of trauma. Cortisol is the stress hormone uh, that is released by the adrenal gland of the brain when the limbic system, or our primal brain, senses danger. In response to a discrete incident of exposure to violence or trauma, there'll be a cortisol release which will eventually return to normal levels. Prolonged and repeated exposure to violence has the impact of altering cortisol levels enduringly. Children who are exposed, abused or exposed to abuse early are flooded with the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol impacting on how the brain functions and develops and stress regulation. This in turn impacts on the area of the brain which controls feelings, meaning that the individual is more likely to be highly stressed, have difficulties with anger and emotions, and be prone to self-harm, anxiety, suicide and depression. Research shows us that children exposed to violence and abuse often respond excessively to minor triggers. This as a result of decreased frontal lobe functioning and increased limbic system sensitivity, um, yeah, resulting in, in that. And only in a state of non-hyperarousal um, are we allowed the activation of the prefrontal cortex which is needed for learning and problem solving. Children repeatedly exposed to family violence run on, con on a constant high because they're continually anticipating further danger. Their bodies are flooded with fight or flight hormones and with their limbic systems constantly engaged. And with the primal brain engaged for action, the consequence is that the ability to feel compassion and empathy towards others is compromised, as is reasoning, forethought and other metacognitive processes. A child's behaviour as a result of trauma and resultant alterations in brain state can look to the untrained observer as hyperactivity, impulsivity, aggression, overreactiveness, dissociation, and even that that, that child is cold or, or unempathic. Sadly, the story doesn't end there. The horrifying travesty of trauma and the trajectory of trauma is that this brain is now rewired as a result of the trauma and adversity and now has chromosomal alterations that are then passed down to their progeny or their next generation. In effect, research tells us that the following generation will inherit molecular memory, which has the impact of them too being hardwired with those same traumas and trauma responses as if they had actually experienced those traumas themselves. Babies born into this world, hardwired for survival in a world dominated by fear, danger and adversity. We can therefore extrapolate that every day approximately one in seven babies are born into this new world with heightened levels of anxiety, stress, and with that, hardwired for fight, flight, and freeze behaviors. And keep in mind that people who react to the world from their primal brain do not well endear themselves to others. And as a result, further adversity, danger, and exposure to multiple traumas continues. And then again, into the following generation. The study of this phenomena, phenomena is called epigenetics. That is molecular memory that is passed down through to consequent generations. But don't just lose hope yet. Now we get to the good part, the good news. You see, the beauty of science and biology is that the laws are exact and that there are always equal and opposite forces. These laws are consistent and predictable. 
and new epigenetic trauma research has demonstrated that behavioural symptoms associated with trauma can be undone with environmental enrichment. In other words, environmental enrichment <coughs> has been shown to reverse the molecular pr processes of the gene that was inherited to perpetuate the traumatised brain. Therefore, we're here today to talk about the prevention of the generational perpetuation of the impact of exposure to family violence. There is often debate as to whether we should be investing in prevention, uh, early intervention, postvention, or intervention at the sharp end of the stick and at the other end of the spectrum, rehabilitative vention. Um, and today I'm going to implore you to consider, in light of what has already been shared, that all vention in this space, family in the space of family harm, has a preventative element to its investment. And that all vention is necessary to combat the repercussions of the intergenerational disease that continues to perpetuate itself in the homes and lives of so many of our New Zealand families and our children. Currently, our family harm wellbeing vention investment is not sophisticated enough, as uh, Bridget has already shared with us. Certainly not sophisticated enough to intervene for our next generation. The impact of all ventions in responding to children exposed to family violence needs to start with a foundational focus on three key therapeutic in in intentions. These being a sense of belonging, enabling meaningful social connection, and self-efficacy. Well-meaning interventionists get caught up on focusing on the goals of therapies being self-actualization when the foundations of well-being have not been consolidated or even considered. And then we wonder why the, why the interventions don't work or are not working. Bridget's paper has provided us with the stock take on which therapeutic approaches are most likely to contribute to therapeutic outcomes and therefore trajectory altering impacts for our children affected by family violence. These therapeutic approaches are by no means the silver bullet. Whether it be CBT, DBT, PCIT, ACT, APT or any other T <laughs> therapies, these should be likened to the fertiliser to a seed or a tender shoot that is struggling to grow, as opposed to the necessities of life such as fertile soil, sunlight and water. And of course further to that, that seed is more likely to thrive in its development within the context of a healthy whānau or a community of trees, more commonly referred to as a forest. We must not assume that we can always intervene with fertiliser. We cannot assume that each child and whānau that we work with has a foundation of aroha, of whānau and of mana, or in other words, a sense of belonging, meaningful social connection and self-efficacy. These things do need to be at the centre of the intended outcome or impact for every vention that we propose to apply. From a social investment methodology, we need to take a whole of life course approach, working systemically within a with a whānau-centric focus. We must intervene with intention of changing life trajectories and intervening as early as possible to enable environments conducive to normal cortisol fluctuation development. These strategies might be expensive, but the potential, no, actually the likelihood for significant social return on investment gives us the impetus. Our investment should take the form of a socio-ecological framework, and with each part of our investment strategy joined up and interdependent upon each part of the integrated system of change and care. For example, don't read that, I'll tell you what the example is. <laughs> For example, um, the individual tamariki or rangatahi is enabled to access readily available developmentally and culturally relevant therapies via a mul multiplicity of mediums, not least of which being um, online. And concurrently, parents and caregivers in whānau are accessing relevant parent coaching and support services and relationship therapies. At school, our children have the support of skilled and well-resourced nurses and pastoral staff who actually work with whānau. And at that same school, and in all schools, our tamariki are learning about respect, resilience, resistance and manakitanga within their curriculum, which enables them with skills to then go on to mentor other children. 
Whilst all vention can be broadly categorised as prevention, we need to start somewhere, and the earlier in a child's life where they have been exposed to violence, the better. The Social Investment Board of South Auckland has responded to this call <coughs> to do things differently and better, and is focusing efforts, resources and investment towards our youngest children being impacted by poverty and adversity. Our initial analytics revealed priorities for our intervention settings, those being vulnerable tenancies, drug and alcohol issues as well as mental health, in-home um, intensive visitations, quality early childcare and family harm. The opportunity for investment in joined up integrated communities of care is here. We now have ministry leaders sitting at the same tables joining together with aligned values and outcomes to be achieved. The opportunity for social investment with dedicated analytics for measurable outcomes and impact has been enabled. The What Works for children exposed to family violence is a catalyst piece of work. It implores us to, to focus in on this kaupapa and beseeches us as leaders, whether we be policy makers, public servants, non-government servants, practitioners and community leaders to respond. Respond for our children, for our children's children, ngā mokapuna, ngā rangatira moa popo, not one more generation. Tēnā koutou katoa.